I want to uh, pray for a family before we begin. Um, many of you, uh, if you've been around for a while, you're probably familiar with a young man who was a part of our praise team for many years, a gentleman by the name of James Payne. James was a part of our praise team, played the piano, uh, was really involved in, in mentoring a lot of uh, younger guys, specifically teaching them instruments, and a lot of the guys who were involved in uh, some of our praise teams were trained by James. Unfortunately, this past Wednesday, James went home to be with the Lord. Just 36 years old, young, um, and so we, uh, I want us to pray for his wife, Alyssa, and for their little girl, Alina, and James's parents are, are Arlen and Lana Payne, who are missionaries of ours to the Seminole Indians. And so I want us to take just a moment and pray for the Payne family. Uh, the funeral will be tomorrow. Visitation is at Hunter's Funeral Home right here, right next door at 10 o'clock. And then the service will be at 11 o'clock if you're interested. But let's just spend just a moment praying for the Payne family. Can we do that? Let's pray together. Father, we're reminded of what you tell us in your word, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And Father, there are situations that happen that we just don't understand. Lord, how could a 36-year-old healthy young man all of a sudden come down with some infection that just after a few months will take his life? Father, we, we can't explain that. Father, we realize that death is a part of life and we embrace that but father quite frankly it's difficult for us to understand so i pray right now for Alyssa, his wife lord i pray that you would minister to her i pray that the peace of god which is beyond understanding would minister to her heart and her mind i pray for a little lena alina or that now is going to grow up without a daddy at home and father we pray for her i pray that you'd provide for all of their needs we pray for arlen and lana Lord, no doubt they are grieving as well in all of this. And Father, I just pray that you would minister to them as well. Father, you define yourself as the God of all comforts. So God, we pray that you would comfort them in the struggles and in the mourning and the loss that they're going through right now. And we rejoice that James is in your presence. And Lord, where you've always intended for him to be. And we rejoice in that, and we look forward to seeing him one day as well. So bless that family. Bless our time as we look in your word this morning. Teach us from your word. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. What a coincidence. You ever made that statement before? Something happened in your life that just kind of was out of the normal, and you sat back and thought, what a coincidence. The dictionary defines a coincidence as the occurrence of events that happen at the same time, seemingly by accident, but seem to have some connection. For example, you show up at the store at the same time as a friend that you haven't seen for a long time. And you're there in the checkout line and all of a sudden he or she is there and you look at each other and you say... What a coincidence that we're here at the exact same time. Or maybe you receive a check in the mail on the same day that you receive a bill for a similar amount. And you look at the check and you look at the bill and you think, what a coincidence that these came on the same day. Or maybe your hot water heater breaks on the same day that you have a bunch of guests that are coming to your house. And you sit back and say, oh my word, what a coincidence. By the way, that actually happened to Pastor Jose this week. He had a bunch of friends coming over and his hot water heater busted. And he called me, what a coincidence. The, this morning I was speaking in the Spanish service and I was in this point right here when all of a sudden this wall, this temporary wall just falls in the other auditorium and everybody yelled out, what a coincidence. Que coincidencia, they said. We're talking about coincidences and what happened right when we're talking about it. Well, we define all of those events as unique coincidences. Two events that seemingly randomly happen at the same time. But let me ask you this morning and put on your thinking caps just a little bit. For a believer, 
is there really such a thing as a coincidence? Could it be, think with me this morning, could it be that the situations that you and I attribute to fate or chance are actually God working behind the scenes in our life, accomplishing his plans in our life. You might sit back and say, oh, come on now, Brian, God's not interested in the small details of my life. He is interested in the small details of your life. And we'll see that here in the book of Ruth today, that God was working in the life of Ruth and Naomi too, or Naomi. Help me out, Vicki. I keep pronouncing it in Spanish. Naomi, that I did it right. Vicki said that all last week I pronounced it Noemi, which is the Spanish pronunciation. You'll have to forgive me. I just spoke in Spanish and did it again and came over here. So sometimes the words go back and forth. So if I say Naomi or no, Noemi, it's the exact same person, okay? You get that. All right. Sorry, my brain's not working well this morning. So could it be that God was working in the lives of these two seemingly obscure women fulfilling his purpose in their lives we're going to see that play out specifically here in ruth chapter 2 last week we began our study of the book of ruth and we stated that we want to look at the christmas story but with a twist this year we want to look at this Christmas story, but from a different perspective. If you've been here long enough at our church, in most churches, generally during Christmas, we look at the incarnation, we take the story of Jesus' birth from one of the four Gospels, or we might look at the Old Testament prophecies and see how those Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' birth was fulfilled or were fulfilled. But this year we want to look at Christmas with a twist. And I would remind you, as we said last week, that the Christmas story is not just a New Testament story. The Christmas story is a story of all of God's word, as God in his divine sovereignty is bringing about his perfect plan through Jesus Christ for your life and for mine, for your salvation and for mine. So in the first chapter, if you didn't, if you weren't here last week and you want to hear that message, you can go back and watch it on our website. But in chapter one, we were introduced to two women. We were introduced to Naomi and Ruth. You'll remember that Naomi had left Israel for Moab with her husband Elimelech. There was a famine in the land. Elimelech was concerned about feeding his family, and so he, he grabbed his wife, and he grabbed his two boys, Malon and, uh, and Chilion, and, uh, and he took them to the land of Moab where there was food. But you remember that shortly after arriving in Moab, Elimelech died, and Naomi was forced to raise her two sons as a single mom in a foreign land. Malon and Chilion grew up. They met beautiful Moabite women and got married. Life seemed to be getting better for all of them when suddenly Malon and Chilion both died. So here's Naomi in a foreign land, lost her husband, and now has lost her two sons. What was she to do? So Noemi determined to return to Bethlehem, which was the origin of this story. And she encouraged her daughters-in-law, Orpha and Ruth, to return to their families. As we saw last week, Orpha did return to her family. She went back to Moab, to her family, to her religion, to her life, and we've never heard of Orpha again. But Ruth clung to Naomi. And so the text says at the end of chapter 1 that the two of them returned to Bethlehem. What would life hold for them? How, how would these two women, no husbands, no jobs, no means of sustaining themselves, how would they survive? Or could it be that God, in his sovereignty, would intervene in their lives? Those are questions that, that are seen in this chapter. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ruth chapter 2. If you have your iPhone, your iPad, we'll put it up on the screen. I want you to follow along as we walk through this chapter. Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. 
Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man, we'll come back and see that phrase in just a little bit, of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So we mentioned last week that there's three main characters in the story, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. So here we're introduced to Boaz for the very first time. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find, find favor. And she said to her, go what my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned into the field after the reapers, and she happened to come upon the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who is of the clan of Elimelech. Let's pause there for a second and let's kind of put some of this in context. So here's Ruth and Naomi who have returned to Bethlehem, don't have any means of support. And so Ruth looks to her mother-in-law and said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and find a field where I can glean among the ears of grain. That was a phrase that was in verse 2. You say, Brian, okay, what in the world does that mean? All right, it's not our culture, certainly not. This isn't an agricultural place. What is that referring to? Well, that was actually God's answer to welfare in the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament law commanded farmers to use some of their crop to take care of the poor. If you want to look at it, you can find it in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 9 and Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 19. So so God commanded landowners to do or not do two things. First of all, he commanded them that their workers, their harvesters, were not allowed to go back through the fields a second time to pick up any grain that had fallen. That would make sense for us, right? So we're harvesting this field, and so we go through the first time, and we miss some grain. It would make sense to say, okay, we're going to send the workers through another time to pick up some of the grain that had fallen by the wayside. The Old Testament law prohibited farmers for doing that. And the reason being, it was, it was to be left there for the poor to come and glean among the grain. There was a second commandment in the Old Testament that's found in Deuteronomy, is that they were not to harvest the corners of their field. In other words, they could harvest the field, but the corners of the field were to be left for the poor, for the widows and the orphans to come and glean so that they too might be able to eat. As I mentioned, that was God's welfare program. And so here in Ruth chapter 2, that was Ruth's plan. She and her mother-in-law, Naomi, had probably not eaten well for several weeks. They were hungry. And so Ruth looks to Naomi and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the neighboring fields, fields that were presently being harvested or had already been harvested, and I'm going to try my best to gather any grain that falls by the wayside to feed us. And so when you come to verse 3, there's a very interesting phrase that's used there that I want us to see. If you have your Bible, once again, notice in verse 3, it says, So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And notice this phrase. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. The NIV says it this way. It says, As it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz. So, so, so let me ask you this morning. Did that happen by chance? I mean, of all the fields surrounding Bethlehem, all the fields where she could have shown up and started harvesting grain, how in the world did it happen that she shows up at Boaz's field, who was a relative of her father-in-law? And you say, Brian, what does all that mean? We're going to see what all that means today in the next few weeks. Did Ruth just get lucky? Of course not. Was this one of those coincidences of life as i mentioned of all the fields around bethlehem did she just happen as the text says to pick boaz's field i pause there and say this no it was not just a coincidence as a matter of fact i would say this a coincidence is not a coincidence if god is involved in what happens did you catch that A coincidence, what we think is a coincidence, is not a coincidence if in reality God is involved in what happens. 
I would remind you that Noemi and, or Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem penniless, husbandless, and hopeless. Remember at the end of chapter one? Naomi's hopeless. I mean, I, we have no idea what's going to happen. We have no husband. We have no money. How are we going to survive? Yet, quite frankly, God was not worried about their situation. As a matter of fact, God had a pretty cool plan that he was about to put into action. That brings us to our first point today, if you have your outlines in front of you. The first point is this, the circumstances and the events of your life and mine are controlled by the providence of God. The circumstances and the events of your life and mine are controlled by the providence of God. Ruth happening to come to Boaz's field was not a coincidence at all. It was by God's design. It was an act of God's providence in her life. I want to I wanna give you a definition of divine providence today, okay? Divine providence is this. This is the Holman Bible Dictionary who defines it this way. It's God's faithful and effective care and guidance of everything which he has made toward the end which he has chosen. Let me say that again. I'm not sure whether we're putting that up on the screen or not. But it says this. It's God's faithful and effective care and guidance of everything which he has made toward the end which he has chosen. You say, Brian, okay, what does that mean in simple terms? In simple terms, it means this, that God is involved in his creation. (laughs) It It means that God's not aloof, that God is not disconnected from your life and mine. Even even the seemingly insignificant events of our life are controlled by the providence of God. And God is bringing everything, your life and mine, to the conclusion that he has determined. We see this all throughout Scripture. Let me show you a couple of verses. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 says this. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. In other words, you and I can make plans, but it's God who brings those plans to fruition. Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its very decision is from the Lord. Now, we don't cast lots today, so let me put my own little translation on this. So here's what this verse is saying. We throw the dice, but God makes the numbers come up. That's exactly what this verse is saying. You and I throw the dice, but God in his providence. Now don't go out and say, okay, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to the Hard Rock Cafe later on today. And so I'm encouraged that I'm going to throw the dice and God's going to make the numbers come up. I don't think that's what this verse is talking about here. All right? But, but, but the idea very simply is this. You and I live out our lives as if we are in control. And it is a sovereign God in his providence who is making things happen in our lives. Notice Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Paul says it this way. He says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, notice this phrase, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So here's what's happening in your life and mine. God is at work in your life and in mine, working out all things according to to the counsel of his will. And there's so many practical applications that we can draw from that, but the simple truth is this, you are important to God, and the events, the details of your life are important to God. So I look back over my life, and I actually took some time, and it would be kind of fun for you to do it as well. As I look back over my life, I'm amazed at how God's divine providence has directed my life, my and Vicki's life. Can I just share some just really cool facts of now in retrospect how God has guided us to where we are today? In 1980, I went to Bible college, small little Bible college, and 
Atlanta, Georgia, wanting to be a church planter. When I went to Bible college, my plan was to graduate from Bible college and head up to the New England states and plant a church. At that time, there weren't, and there still aren't, many churches up in the New England states. And so I thought, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to train myself, and I'm going to go up to the New England states, and I'm going to plant a church. That was my plan when I was in college. Well, guess what? We graduated, and God never took us north. He took us south, far south, if you know our life. My senior year in college, I roomed now remember, I'm from Canton, Ohio. The only time I'd ever come to Florida, my grandparents lived in Homestead. So we'd come to Florida to vacation. They lived in this trailer park down there. That's all I knew of Florida, all right? To me, Florida was a vacation land. I'd, I really didn't know that people actually lived here. I think it was just people vacation down here. But my senior year of college, didn't know these guys. These two guys ended up being my roommates. Their names were Steve and Craig Tuck. Guess where they were from? Hollywood, Florida. And for a year, until I got tired of it, for a year they told me how fantastic their church was. They just came from the greatest church you could ever imagine, and they went on and on and on and on about their church. They were from First Baptist Church of West Hollywood, which is Hollywood Community Church. In 1980, God directed us to Mexico as missionaries. While there, he gave us a love for the Spanish culture. He gave us a love for the Spanish people, the food, <laughs> and the language as well. Never realizing that we would be able to use that for the rest of our lives. 2001, we moved back to Canton, Ohio, and I was the executive pastor of our home church. And it was there, first time that I, I learned how to lead a large ministry. I had the opportunity to do that, to love on a staff and to administer a growing budget. In 2005, God brought us to South Florida. Not Hollywood Community Church, God brought us to a different church. And we were there, we were there for just a few short years. Without getting specific, just wasn't happy there. It just wasn't a fit for me. And after a few years, we said, you know what? When Mark graduates from high school, we're out of here. We're, we're, we're going to go somewhere else. There's got to be better opportunities. So Mark graduated from high school in 2008, and I literally began sending my resume out to churches that were looking for pastors all across the country. And one day, this was in 2008, one day I just thought, I wonder what our house is worth. And I, I got online and realized that we at that time were $150,000 upside down on our house. And I looked at Vicki and I said, we're stuck here. <laughs> we are stuck in South Florida. What in the world is God up to in our life? And in 2010, God brought us to Hollywood Community Church. Here's what I want you to catch, please. Please, here's what I want you to catch. As much as we tried to do things differently, as much as we tried to go at different places, God worked out His will in our lives. I'm here at Hollywood Community Church this morning, not because this is what I planned, not because this is what I looked for. I'm here today because of the providence of God. And I can see God's hand in our lives each and every step of the way. Now I say that today realizing that there is absolutely nothing special about Brian and Vicki Burkholder. Just as God has sovereignly, supernaturally worked in our lives, just as God has directed our steps, he is directing yours. Psalm 37, 23 says this. It's become my life verse. The steps of a good man are established by God, and he delights in his way. Listen, God is involved in your life. God cares about you, 
And you might sit back and say, man, it doesn't make any sense what's happening to me. God, I don't like what's happening to me. I wish something else was happening to me. Realize that there is a sovereign, almighty God who loves you, who cares for you, and is at work in your life. And you might not know what he is doing, but trust him. The circumstances and events of your life are controlled by the providence of God. That's what God was doing in the life of Ruth and Naomi. He was directing their lives. Let's keep reading. Jump back to the passage. Notice in verse 4 it says this. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. I love, I love the grace of this guy. Hold on. Fasten your seatbelt. You're going to see something really cool in just a second, okay? He said, the Lord be with you. So gracious. And they answered, and the Lord bless you, too. I mean, how many bosses come in, especially in that day and age when these people were slaves, come in and say, God bless you. And they respond, God bless you, too. I mean, this was a unique man. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to the young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is that over there? As Boaz came to observe his field and his property, he sees this young woman who is working among the reapers. We know who it is. And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, why, she's the young Moabite woman who came with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she's continued from early morning until now except for just a short rest. You see how God's working? <laughs> Catch it. Notice how God's at work. Not only did Ruth go to Boaz's field, but on the precise day that Ruth was at Boaz's field, guess who shows up on the field? Boaz shows up. And he immediately notices Ruth. He asked his workers, whose young woman is this? And they respond, she's the Moabite, remember? They came back with Naomi. And Boaz, in his kindness, tells Ruth not to glean in other fields. He even instructed his men to watch out for her. Jump down to verse 10 in the passage. Then she fell on her face. Ruth fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me? Since I'm a foreigner, and you might want to circle that if you have your Bible, we're going to see what that means. But Boaz answered to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. Boaz says, the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel. I love this phrase, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Here's what I want to do for a second. I want to take just a moment and look at the character of these two individuals. And so God highlights Boaz and Ruth in this passage. They're unique and they're an example to us. So notice, first of all, Boaz, just a couple of things about him in the text. You'll remember clear back in the very first verse of the chapter, it says this. It says, Boaz was a worthy man. A virtuous man is what the term means. It has the idea of importance, value. But this man was a man of special character. We've already seen that he was extremely kind. As I mentioned, I love the way that he greeted his servants. And, and I think he demonstrates the fact that no one is more important than anyone else. Just because he's the owner of the property doesn't mean that he's in more important than the people who work for him. The Lord bless you, he responds. And no doubt they love him and respond back, the Lord bless you as well. Then I want you to see something that's not seen in the text, but now in hindsight, we realize what's taking place. If you have your Bible, put your finger here in Ruth chapter 2 and go back with me or go forward with me to Matthew chapter 1. Because Matthew chapter 1 gives us some insight into this man Boaz that demonstrates why he was so gracious. 
Matthew chapter 1, we find the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to unwrap everything today because we'll do that in the next couple of weeks. But in Matthew chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, notice I'm going to read a list of names, all right? And Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nation, and Nashon, the father of Salmon. I know you're probably right now yawning, saying, okay, Brian, what do these names have to do? But notice what it says. And Salmon, the father of whom? Boaz, by whom? Rahab. So here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, we find the name Boaz, this man listed. And it says that he was begotten by Salmon, who was his father or maybe his grandfather, by Rahab. Do you remember who Rahab was? Remember when the Israelites were going into the promised land in Joshua chapter 2? And they were about to cross over the Jordan River, and the first city that they were to conquest or to conquer was the city of Jericho. And they sent out spies to spy out the land, and the spies came to the city of Jericho. And the text tells us, Joshua chapter 2 tells us, that there was a prostitute, that's how the Bible describes her, in Joshua chapter 2, who protected these men. This prostitute Rahab hid these men in her house because the city officials had detected that there were spies spying out the land. And so Rahab, this prostitute, takes these these Israelite spies and hides them in in her house and saves their lives. And as a result, you can read this later, it's in Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 3. As a result of all of this, when the Israelites came in and they conquered the city of Jericho, and you can read how they conquered the city of Jericho, the walls of the city fell flat and they came in and conquered everything and took everyone's lives except for Rahab and her family. And Rahab, who was a foreigner, who was a prostitute, was accepted into the nation of Israel. And so Rahab evidently comes in and is accepted into the nation of Israel, is married, and what? Produces sons and grandsons. One of those sons or grandsons was none other than Boaz here in Ruth chapter 2. So you sit back and now Boaz sees this foreign woman in his field and what does he do he demonstrates grace to her why do you think because his grandmother had been the recipient of grace because she had been the recipient of grace he knew that he was and now so 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 here's this foreign prostitute that comes into israel and now her son or her grandson is a prominent member in the city of beth Boaz realizes that he is where he is because of the grace of God. So when he's given an opportunity, he sees another foreign girl just like his grandmother. And what does he demonstrate? Grace. We'll apply that in just a few moments. Notice Ruth with me today. Ruth was of equal integrity and character. The text tells us that she was a hard worker. Verse 7, she worked from early morning till evening with hardly any breaks. She was humble. Verse 10 tells us she fell on her face whenever Boaz began to treat her with kindness. And she fell on her face and she said, why are you being so kind to me? I'm just a foreigner. I'm not even even on the same level as your servants. Why are you being kind to me? She demonstrates humility. She had a godly character. You say, Brian, how do you know she had godly character? I want you to see two verses. We read the one in chapter 2 and verse 12. Boaz is describing her, talking about her. And Boaz says this, because of the care that she had given to Naomi, her mother-in-law, he says, and the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. If you've read the Old Testament at all, 
specifically the book of Psalms. That phrase, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, is a phrase that is used repeatedly demonstrating one's trust in God. We dwell under the shadow of his wings. It means we trust in him. Boaz looks at her and says, you're a remarkable woman. You are trusting in Yahweh, the God of Israel. One one additional verse in chapter 3. We'll look at that next week. Chapter 3, Boaz makes this statement about Ruth. I'll jump there just so you can see it. Chapter 3 and verse 11, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know you are a worthy woman. Remember how Boaz was described in chapter 2 and verse 1? As a worthy man. Chapter 3 and verse 11, he uses that same word to describe Ruth. It's, It's a word that is very similar to the word that is used for a virtuous woman. As a matter of fact, your translation might say, you are a virtuous woman. Boaz realizes there's something unique, there's something special about Ruth. And by the way, the people of Israel did as well. In certain Hebrew translations of the Old Testament, the book of Ruth comes right after Proverbs 31. You know why that is? Because they view Ruth as the epitome of the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. Listen, I I want you to catch, you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, what in the world does this have to do with me? And what does this have to do with us? God has placed these characters in Scripture for our exhortation, for our edification, and for our learning. And God lifts them up as examples to us. And so the second point in your outline very simply is this. Just like Boaz did and just like Ruth did, God desires for you to demonstrate humble, faithful dependence upon him. Here's what this this book is crying out. This is the way God wants us to live He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be dependent upon him. He wants us to be faithful, just as Ruth and Boaz were. So catch this, church. Here's what he'll do, just as he did for Ruth and Boaz. He will intentionally allow circumstances and events in your life and mine to remind us how much we need to remind us of our dependence upon him. Can I pause there for a second and ask you an introspective question? How dependent are you upon God? How dependent are you upon God? We live in a day and age of independence, right? We want to be as independent as we possibly can. We want to make it our own. We want to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We want to be able to prove that we can do it, and we can do it in our own, and we can do it in our own power. And I would submit to you that God does not want you and I to do things in our own power. God wants us to do things in his power. Our independence is actually at times a rebellion of who God is and who God wants us to be. Because God wants us to be dependent upon him. Just a few questions. Do you attempt to live, love, and serve in your own power? If you do, you're not depending upon God. Do you take pride in your spiritual knowledge and in your spiritual growth? That's self-dependence. Here's a great one, incredibly convicting. How much time do you spend in prayer? Ah, it's a personal question, Brian. Yeah, I know it is. The amount of time that we spend in prayer actually demonstrates how much we depend upon God or how much we don't depend upon God. Because practically, less amount of time in prayer demonstrates the fact that I can do it on my own and I don't need God's help. We only go to him whenever we need him, right? And there might be days when I don't need him, so I don't have to talk to him. And yet God wants us to be fully, completely dependent upon him. The answers to those questions will show you how humble, how faithful, and how dependent you are upon God. And by the way, let me say this. You are more like Jesus when you're humble, broken, 
and dependence upon God than at any other time. You're more like Jesus when you're humble, broken, and dependent upon God. Can I remind you of how Jesus was? Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he uh, emptied himself. He humbled himself, and he took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself even more, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So here's Jesus, and that's one of the things we talk about in the Incarnation at Christmas. One of the great truths of the Incarnation is that God left the splendors of heaven, and he took upon himself human form. And God, in his humility, Jesus laid aside his divine attributes, is what Philippians chapter 2 is telling us. He emptied himself of his divine attributes, and while he was on earth, he lived a life that was completely dependent to God. God and the Holy Spirit of God, demonstrating that it's possible for us to do that. So once again, let me say this, you are more like Jesus when you are humble, broken, and dependent than any other time in your life. You see, God blessed Boaz and Ruth because they desperately needed the grace of God. And as recipients of God's grace, they then demonstrated that grace to others. Let me show you one more thing, and I'm done. My time's up. Verses 14 through 17 says this, follow along. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and when she had some left, and she had some left over, when she arose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some of the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, and she beat out what she had gleaned and took away about an ephah of barley. You see, what Boaz does here is extraordinary. He doesn't just extend to her the rights of a foreigner as laid out in the law of Moses, the same rights as Jewish laborers, but he invited her to eat with the other reapers. She did. She ate until she was full Perhaps the first time she was satisfied in weeks. She then returns to the fields unbeknown to her. Boaz commanded his reapers to do some special favors to Ruth. Besides letting her glean harvest wherever she wanted, they were to deliberately drop handfuls on purpose. Drop handfuls of grain on purpose in her path so that she would have abundant provision. Did you imagine her coming behind the reapers? She must think, man, these reapers are like the most careless people in the world. Good grief, I can't believe the amount of grain that I'm harvesting here. These irresponsible reapers, look at all this food. The reapers were not to rebuke her or hinder her in any way. There's a third truth there that I want you to catch, and it's this. Just as God provided for Ruth more than she needed. God provides for you and me more than you and I need. God generously provides for you with more than you need. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that godliness with contentment is great gain. We were brought we brought nothing into the world and we can't take anything out of the world. He says but if we have two things we'll be content. If we have food and clothing we will be content. Paul says, when you think about it, those are the only two things that are really necessary for, for, for survival. Food and clothing. And with food and clothing, we should be content. And yet God in his grace gives us what? Extra handfuls. He intentionally allows other things to fall our way so that we can receive more than we need. 
2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over so that we can hoard for a rainy day. What does he say? Plenty left over to share with others. Think of all that you have this morning. Can I ask you to think about all you have this morning? You don't just have one set of clothes. You have a closet full of clothes today. As a matter of fact, you probably have clothes in your closet that you haven't wore for a long time, right? Husbands are like, yeah, Brian, preach it, right? (laughs) Preach it. You have a nice house with plenty of furniture. Most of you don't have one car. You probably have two cars. You don't have one television set in your house. You probably have multiple television sets in your house. You don't have enough food for today, but you have too much food. So much so that we throw away more than any other country in the world. Listen, these are luxuries that we don't need, nor quite frankly do we deserve. But God gives us more than we need. Are you entitled this morning? Or do you humbly thank him for his provision? Well, I'm, I, I'm not... As an American church, I think we're entitled. I wish I could put you all on a plane and take you around the world. I wish I could take you to Burkina Faso, West Africa, and have you see how the people there worship and the small amount that they have and the joy that's in their life. I wish I could take you to Karai, Haiti today and let you see how those people, with the joy of God in their heart, worship God with not a hundredth of what you and I have. And yet they're extremely grateful. God gives us more than we need. One last thing, a few more verses. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening. She beat out what she had gleaned. It was about an epa of barley. She took it up and went to the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought it out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Noemi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Noemi said to her, the man of ours is a close relative and one of our redeemers. You said, Brian, what in the world does that mean? You got to come back next Sunday as Brad's going to pull out Ruth chapter 3 next Sunday. So here's the application today, church. Please catch this. Please catch this. This is a great story. But behind the story is a truth for your life and mine. Just like Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, you are a recipient of the grace of God. God in his mercy, God in his love has demonstrated so much grace on your life and mine. He providentially guides you. He generously provides for you. If that weren't enough, he sent his son Jesus who vicariously died for you. He's demonstrated grace to you. Have you responded to that grace? Has there been a time in your life where you by faith have reached out to Jesus Christ and you recognize that your salvation, your future, your hope, your life is totally in him and you have humbled yourself before God and you have repented of your sins and you have trusted in Jesus, in Jesus alone. That's how you respond to grace. And if you've never done that, I'd encourage you in your heart right where you are today, right now, just to reach out to God and in, gra- and in gratitude receive his gift of grace. And I would challenge all of us as followers of Jesus during this Christmas 
season. Let's look for ways to demonstrate grace. You know, quite frankly, quite frankly, those who receive a lot of grace sometimes are the most ungracious people. And as believers, sometimes we're the most ungracious people. Let's not be ungracious. Take this week and look for an opportunity to be Jesus in the life of somebody else. Demonstrate grace. Do to them what God has done for you. Would you stand with me? Jonas and the team are coming to close in prayer today. I guess I would say one more time, if you're here today and and there's never been a moment in your life when you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. We can use all the terms, you've been saved, you've, you've trusted in Christ, you believe in him and him alone, whatever term you want to use. If there's never been a moment in your life, I would encourage you right now in your heart of hearts to make that decision and give your life to Jesus. We have elders down front who would love nothing more than to pray with you and help you and to guide you. And ask God this week to help us to be the most gracious people in Hollywood because we've been recipients of his grace. Lord, thank you so much for the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz in Ruth chapter 2. Help us to live out these truths in our lives. Help us by faith to turn to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.